associate professor um, at University of Minnesota and holds the, I hope I pronounce this correct, Kubner and Gao Chair in Education and Technology. And also I think the very first co-director in a learning diplomatics lab. So I know his work and it's an intersection of learning sciences, learning analytics, network science, and online learning. And I think he's very creative of, in analyzing for PD discourse and comes up with a lot of data mining uh, for teachers' professional development. So um, I want to pass the time to him so that I think it will be a wonderful talk. Yeah, go down. Thank you so much for your kind words, actually. Um, it's, a, it's such an honor to be here. It's my first time in Taiwan. Um, and it's also an honor to be an invited speaker at this conference. Uh, it's also my first SEC conference. And I'm having a good time here. Um, so um, this is, I'm going to talk today about um, some really preliminary work uh, I and my team has been, have been doing uh, in the past two years. So uh, please anticipate some disjoint, disjointed um, points and ideas. And I'm also coming to call for help uh, because I'm trying to invite you to help me connect those disconnected ideas with your work and also with the context you're working in so that we can um, um, essentially um, build knowledge together for the public good. So that's my purpose of this talk. Uh, briefly, because um, this is the, the sick of learning sciences and CSCL. I'm co-chairing the membership session, um, a membership committee of the International Society of Learning Sciences. And since our president is also at, at the conference, I have to put up a slide, uh, just basically inviting you to, um, to connect with our uh, International Society of Learning Sciences as well. And also want to start by acknowledging um, um, a great team of, of collaborators and students and teachers who have been contributing to this work. Um, and Lian is one uh, collaborator who's also attending. So if you have any hard questions, she'll answer them. Uh, <laughs> and so this is the, uh, the agenda for, for the talk. Uh, I'll, I'll start by talking a bit about the background and the motivations uh, why I'm doing this type of work. And I'll um, move on to talking about knowledge building as a unique pedagogy and theory, and uh, also um, a system of technology. And I'll also uh, quickly talk about two research projects that I have been working on with my team. One is called Idea Magnets, another is called Data Expedition. And I'll end by um, making a few open invitations to you so that we can work together. And this map is, um, if you don't know where Minnesota is, you might know it's cold, uh, but this is the, actually the location of Minnesota. This is the, the globe, this is the United States, and Minnesota is right at the border um, between Canada and the US. So uh, it's in the Midwest, but it's, um, uh, it's a good place because we have a lot of lakes. Um, so I want to start um, by quoting John Dewey. Um, so almost 120 years ago, when he wrote this book about school and society, he wrote that from the standpoint of a child, the great waste in the school comes from his, in his, I think also her inability to utilize experiences he gets outside the school, while on the other hand, he's unable to apply in daily life what he's learning at school. That is isolation of the school, it's isolation from life. So it's not surprising for him to continue to talk about education. It's not preparation for life, but it is life itself. Um, so I think that even after 120 years, I still find inspirational and come back to this quote all the time. When I think about what it, education is and what, as educator myself, what I can do in my work. Um, well, we recognize there's an isolation between school, between education, and the life. We're, we are facing, as a, as a human uh, society, facing all kinds of issues and challenges. And this is a uh, the image of the shrinking Arctic ice sheets over the years, and there's our hard evidence um, pr provided by the scientific community, um, and there's a, a growing uh, carbon dioxide emission, um, mapping out different countries and the patterns across the years as well. However, um, at the more societal level, there's a 
in the US at least, there is a growing divide um, in terms of ideological thinking, and this uh, is a map um, for visualization put together by Pew Researcher uh, Center um, saying or demonstrating that the Democratic or Republicans, they're becoming more divided over the years. And, and taking a different look at the Twitter conversation, this is a, from a paper written in 2017 uh, uh, showing how Twitter um, participants are talking with, with each other or retweeting each other. So they're, they're basically discovering that um, the red um, camp and the blue camps are not retweeting each other. So that forms kind of information bubbles that uh, we're not really talking with each other, even though we're facing so many challenges. And th this is another um, uh, survey finding uh, about asking the general public, what do you think, what do you think climate change is real? Um, as you can see, the US is at the bottom. Um, a, lot of things, a lot of people think they're um, not real, or they don't agree it's, it's happening. Um, so that point out to the, the huge um, epistemic crisis we're facing. Um, even though we're facing so many challenges as a, as a society, however, we don't believe in those, um, those evidence provided by scientific community. So that's an that's epistemic crisis. So nowadays, we're kind of, it doesn't matter that much whether we know or not, it matters more whether we choose to know or not. So we have evidence, but sometimes people tend to choose what, we, what they believe in instead of reasoning about the evidence that they are provided. So that's a kind of societal background. And I um, uh, want to kind of point out that Chinese people have figured out uh, 2,000 or four years ago, uh, this is a quote from Confucius, well not Confucius, but um, the analects of Conf Confucius saying, that means when you know a thing, to hope what you know it. When you do not know a thing, to allow that you do not know it. This is knowledge. It's kind of very meta level um, understanding about knowledge, which is so lacking these days. And, and, and I want to kind of point that out um, um, as, a, as a way to kind of call for more investment in helping the, the public developing more epistemic fluency and flexibilities that is so crucial um, for today's world. And in the same time, there's a whole body um, of work and, and argument that we're now in the knowledge society. Um, I go back to the opening keynote as well. It's very inspiring to, um, to see that we're in the need of new knowledge to solve this problem I presented. And we we're need new innovation to drive new economic growth or to drive this um, innovative solution to those problems. Um, so this is a really societal a need we're facing now. So that really motivates um, the work uh, I'm going to dive into now, um, which is called knowledge building. Knowledge building um, was, um, is, a, is a theory, is a learning theory, is a pedagogy, and also is an integrated system um, to support um, anybody to become a part of the knowledge creating society. And it was uh, proposed by two scholars. One is uh, Marty Scalamedia and Carl Ryder, which uh, who I worked with. I'm so fortunate to work with them when I was in Toronto. And they proposed this to basically to refashion education in a fundamental way so that it becomes a coherent effort to initiate students into a knowledge creating culture. So it really addresses um, the challenge I mentioned heads on by, by providing different kinds of support for students, including technological support and pedagogical support so that they can become a part of the knowledge creating society. That's a key motivation of this, this, this um, approach. Um, and with that, um, they are thinking, they, even though as educators, it's hard to believe that edu uh, children, especially younger children, they can create new knowledge. But they, um, Marian and Carl, they're really making an argument that we're not really using this term metaphorically. We're, we're really meaning that children are creating not new knowledge. And, we as an educator, we need to support that. And it goes back to what, mentioned about, what I mentioned about June Dewey, is uh, even if um, we might think that we're preparing children to be not creator in the future, but Marty and Carl, they're arguing that we want to do that now. We don't want to ask them to wait until they're adults before uh, they can actually create new knowledge. So this, this claim is, is, well, is backed by uh, a number of um, components and um, I co authored a paper in uh, 2016 kind of reviewing those different tenets of this um, pedagogy. Uh, that includes creative expertise, um, ideas in word three. Uh, that means ideas are 
having uh, their own live trajectory, and also knowledge communities. And with that, as a, as a knowledge building international community, we have been developing all kinds of innovations uh, based on 12 principles. Um, principles including we need to start from the real ideas from students, and we need to engage them to solve authentic problems, we need to engage them to talk with each other, to, be, to engage in knowledge building discourse, and so on. So we're using, we're deriving these principles based on these key tenets, and then um, we'll build technology, um, we'll build uh, pedagogical support, and we'll build our design discourse processes to support the knowledge building work. So that's kind of one slight overview of, of knowledge building, if you are new to this, uh, to this topic. And um, I mentioned there's a there technology built for knowledge building, and this is uh, the key uh, or the major technology called knowledge form that has been around. Actually, uh, it was invented before I was born. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's not a joke. Uh, it, is, uh, quite, it has been around for quite a while. Um, so it's a, it's a, a, inter it's a, a web um, tool that a student can get on and then write about their idea. This is an older version, and this is a newer version we have been building. And even though it might look similar to uh, some other you know, concept mapping tools or online discussion tool, but what's key in this environment is there are different kinds of um, scaffolds or supports built into this environment. For example, we have a build on. Um, so when you click on the build on uh, button, you are replying to this message, but also with the commitments that you are you're trying to improve this idea. You're not replying to this message saying, I like it or uh, I don't like it. So there's a, um, there's a commitment to the knowledge when you're doing stuff in this space, and there are also uh, epistemic scaffolds provided in this environment so that uh, st students, even though they're younger ages, they have still, um, they're scaffolded to think in different ways and, 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 and introduce in different kinds of um, ideas into their discourse. So um, if you're interested, I can talk more about this um, um, with you afterwards. So that's the kind of background in terms of the knowledge building. But what I see um, more, I'm a more, um, I have a background in educational technology. So I, I tend to build technology and I tend to design uh, as, uh, things as well. So for the talk today, um, after spending 10, 10 minutes uh, giving you the background, is to really um, to um, ask for new principal designs uh, to create new conditions for knowledge building for the public good. What I find a gap in knowledge building technologies so far is we tend to, uh, even though we have the aspiration of connecting student uh, knowledge work in the classroom with the society, but we don't have much um, technological support for that. For example, knowledge forum itself, um, uh, as, it, as it now, it's more kind of disconnected with the broader open web. Um, we want to engage students to solve authentic problems, but it's really hard technologically to, to bridge this connection. So for me as a technologist, I want to design new features or new affordances to make that happen more easily. So the, the talk today is more about um, my effort in this area. And I'll be talking about two projects, as I mentioned, the first project is called ID Magnet, and the second project is about um, a data expedition. So let's dive into the first project. So I tend to speak faster when I'm excited. <laughs> So the first project is called ID Mac. It's, it's, a, it's an NSF-funded project. Uh, has been running for two and a half years, and uh, this is a team who's behind this work, really. And the goal is to bridge knowledge with the, the knowledge building with the public discourse, and it's, it's in the context of high school science. And I work with uh, a few teachers from one school in Minneapolis. And um, the participant of this study um, are uh, were five ninth grade um, classes uh, involving around 100 students. And the school is very culturally, linguistically, and socioeconomically diverse. So that's kind of the fact. And we worked with a nonprofit organization called Hypothesis. And Hypothesis is a nonprofit you know, technology startup. They have a social mission. They're trying to, uh, they have a mission of building open, interoperable layers of conversation over the web. So that's a higher level mission. They work with educators, work, they work with journalists, they work with publishers to make that happen you know, and apply that in different areas of the society. So as an educator, we worked, I work with them and then try to kind of build on their open source technology. 
Uh, that's really a core part of this project is to connect Knowledge Forum as an educational tool with Hypothesis, which is an open source, uh, more general purpose tool. Um, so what they are trying to demonstrate here, this is a web, web content. They are, they are trying to engage um, any user to annotate uh, the web content by creating annotations, they call it web annotation. And also you can reply to other people's annotations so that you have a conversation on top of any web page. Uh, this idea is not new, but they're, um, they're behind a, a whole bo um, group of uh, standard makers who are making standards around web annotations. So they're becoming more prominent as they invest in this area as well. So with that, um, this is one example of the, what they're doing. They're having a website called Climate Feedback, which involves scientists to, um, to review a news article uh, and then provide a rating after care for uh, annotation, provide a rating about uh, any news article and see whether it's credible or not. Um, so, um, so they're doing such work in different areas. So for, my, for this project, we started by um, eating a lot of donuts um, <laughs> with teachers. Uh, we've spent one year doing design workshops with teachers and we bring donuts. Um, so this is a classroom we go to almost every, every two weeks and then we talk about different design ideas. And, and the result of that is basically two components of the ID Magnus tool. The first component is to, um, to based on, to use the hypothesis annotation tool. What you see here, this is sidebar annotation tool. You select a piece of information, you make an annotation, you add a tag, then you contribute the annotation to your community. So this is the first component. And the second component is, um, as a knowledge building community, we want to use that information we annotated. So the first, the second component is to bridge the annotation we've made on the public space. For example, now the student is writing a note, and then those annotations will be aggregated right here. So the student can actually drag and drop to incorporate that annotation they made uh, as a community to support their work in knowledge form. This is a knowledge form. So those are the, the design we came up with after talking with the teachers. Uh, and then um, they, they're happy, so I, I was happy as well. So, um, so that, then we put that tool in the classroom. We design uh, pedagogical uh, interventions, uh, we work with them, and that's when the, new, uh, the Green New Deal came about in the US. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a uh, Green New Deal is a, is a new proposal um, uh, proposed by a, a, a representative from New York. Um, her name is Alexandria Ossesia Cortez. Um, that has an attracted a lot of attention and debates in the US. So at that time, uh, this came about. So, uh, and the project um, the students were doing was about energy. So it's a perfect fit. And then we tried to engage, so basically the design with this tool was to engage students to think about this huge societal debate that's happening in the US. And think about which kind of questions and problems they want to solve in their science classroom, because they're also doing uh, science learning in an area of energy, energy sources, and so on. So it's a perfect uh, connection that the teacher uh, really came up with. So within this context, we designed a pedagogical intervention, which had three different com uh, major components. The first one was to um, ask the student to um, generate problems around the Green, the green uh, New Deal. And the second is to have uh, problem-centered engagement with the public discourse. And the third one is to conduct evidentiary reasoning with public sources. And those are major components kind of extracted from this giant diagram that we co-designed with the teacher after many, many conversations. So uh, it's kind of a very collaborative and participatory process to make it work for the classroom and in, in the same time meaningful uh, for the students as well. So with that, uh, as a researcher, we have some uh, very quick and simple questions because this project is still in, in its early phase. The question we ask is, um, uh, in what ways did the use of web annotation facilitate student sense-making of public discourse? And also, in what ways did the use of ID magnets encourage students to connect public discourse with their classroom discourse? And for this talk, I will really quickly go through this, um, those findings without really trying to talk about many details. But we did analyze some data sources, including the knowledge from logs, hypothesis logs, and some artifact-based group interviews. 
Um, and we grouped, we, we derived some descriptive statistics so that we can kind of describe students based on how active they are in different spaces. Then we use that information to group students into small groups for the interviews. And then we analyze their interview transcripts and the, their discourse content. So, so in this talk, I'm going to really quickly go through some, some major findings of this analysis. So first of all, this is the view of their, uh, their library, their community library of annotation. Uh, that is hosted on Hypothesis. And as you see, uh, in this specific uh, class, they have made around 250 annotations, and there are many different, um, each line here is a source, is a web page, basically. They, they were provided some, some, some uh, sources, in the same time they went, ventured to find some sources on their own as well. And also, um, those are tags they use. They, have, they came up with a very sophisticated system of tagging, uh, such as you see key T, I think that's knowledge type. SC is, um, I even forgot. So they have two different categories. Um, SC is probably um, science, science content, that's my, yeah, science content. One is more about content, another one is about, about the meta level, knowledge type, um, meta level of this uh, information. So that's the, the annotation they have conducted on the public discourse. And with that, this is one more, a zoom in to one page. This is one page of their annotation. There is some annotation made by a few students on the sidebar about greenhouse effect. So with that, the students were talking about uh, those different ideas of knowledge from as well. This is one view from one view when they're talking about the goal of 100% renewable energy. It started by what kind of renewable energy are we, right, um, are we at right now? And um, so some student kind of incorporated annotation into uh, the response uh, saying this is the percentage, 60% renewable energy um, in um, which year, 2009. And some other student, because they're looking at different sources, this is 2015 is 10%. So they're trying to make sense of the changes of, of percentages of renewable energy in the US even though they're joined from different sources and they're joined from different web pages. And they're kind of incorporating a diverse set of information to answer their question. And this is another example, it's another view, a knowledge building um, thread, uh, it's about causes of climate change. One student asked the question about what is green new house, uh, greenhouse gas, uh, why it's called greenhouse gas, and what does it have to do with climate change? And some other student replied saying, um, it's like an analogy of what happens in a greenhouse. All the CO2 gets trapped at the top. It's actually a misconception there, but um, they kind of try to reason and try to build their knowledge together. And later on, there's some other student contributed annotations, such as this one. They dragged an annotation into the space, um, saying the gas uh, in the atmosphere act as greenhouse for solar radiation, trapping it and heating uh, into the earth. And this is another one. Um, so they keep kind of going on and then really trying to bridge what they were talking about on the, on the web with what they were trying to solve in the classroom. And over time, I think, for example, this one, is they start to uh, move from uh, talking about what is greenhouse towards different gases stay in the atmosphere for different amounts of time, but mix so that they stay for average amount of time usually. So they, they talked more deeply about how different gases survive or exist in the, in the atmosphere and really open up for more questions and problems for them to solve. Um, and we also interviewed, let's see how much time we have. We also interviewed um, some students about their perception about this process because this process is new and they didn't have this exposure before. We want to ask, what do you think about what's the value of doing this? And there are two key aspects. The first aspect is more about individual. Uh, um, so annotating, what does it mean for them? So one student said, using hypothesis has helped me think about articles more. And also when, uh, but when we have to make annotation and really think about the stuff, we're highlighting and making annotation about, it's a lot easier to remember information because they have really processed the information well when they're annotating individually. And also at the group level, when we, when we ask them about uh, the process of using idea magnets, they're saying, uh, with idea magnets, if you're making annotation, it's helpful to look at what other people have found 
and, and also opposing ideas too, uh, so that you can look at what they're doing and then put that in and it would make a better answer for you. And another student said, if I want to contribute to someone else's thing, if it's connected to mine, I could use my own annotation, but also other people's annotation, so it didn't personally, that I didn't personally study. So it really opened up, I think, um, the, the diversity of ideas and also the, the willingness to, um, to uh, incorporate opposing ideas, which is so hard for adults, right? Uh, um, but for students, they're, uh, when exposing, when you get exposed to different um, information and thinking about them individually, it opened up possibility for them to deal with opposing ideas in this space. And another class, two students said, uh, um, well, a lot of people were using any magnets, so uh, I was studying copper, so I was able to just go in there and find stuff that was relevant. And uh, uh, another student said, it makes it easier to find stuff. It's good to switch out what tags they're searching for. So if you're trying to find a specific source, then if you can click on copper and human source or whatever. So that demonstrated a really sophisticated way for them uh, that's connected to information literacy. They're trying to use different index, uh, in a different way of indexing their information, and then a sophisticated way to search for information using tags, using search functions, and then incorporate into their discourse. So um, even though the project itself was not about improving information literacy, but by really bridging their classroom discord with the public discourse through this technology, we see some uh, interesting uh, perspectives shared by the student in, in this area as well. Um, so to summarize uh, for this project, uh, what we observed from the first pilot, it's really preliminary again, is there's a culture in this classroom about, about collaborative annotation. It's annotating for person, for individuals, but also for the community. And there's also a sophisticated attempt to index and use their community knowledge base. And also they're purposefully using, and also uh, constructively using the sources they identify on the web. So that's kind of very promising finding for this project, even though it's uh, in the first phase. We want to kind of iterate on, on our finding and make tweaks in the design to make it even more connected with the public discourse. So, um, I'm going to move on to the second project. The second project is a different, very different project. It's called Data Expedition. And, um, and the reason I call it Data Expedition was um, there are scientists who make expedition to different, different areas of the world, to Arctic, to, uh, to Nepal, to Australia. Um, and for, some, for students, sometimes it's hard to do that, right? Um, so we want to use open data as kind of a boundary object so they don't have, open data are produced by open um, governmental agencies and scientific communities and shared online. There are a lot of open data there. We want to use it as a boundary object for students to really inquire about an area. In this case, uh, using open data to compute and then to, to think about, uh, to solve authentic problems. So that's why we call it data expedition. And then the first pilot was conducted at a lab school in Toronto and Lian uh, Ma here has been a big part of that project. Um, and we conducted a study with one sixth grade class. Um, they were discussing United Nations system, Sustainable Development Goals at that time. So if you're not familiar with the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, there are basically 17 goals put together by United Nations saying that we have to achieve those goals by uh, 2030. And the first goal is no poverty, for example, zero hunger, good health and well-being, and uh, clean water and, and sanati sanati uh, sanita sanitation, uh, and also uh, many, many other goals. Very hard to achieve, but very important for the survival of, of everybody. Um, so the students were talking about this uh, for, for a while, and, and this is the technology, again, we, we try to build on open source technology. This is a technology that was developed by the Concord Consortium. Uh, which is a non-profit research organization in the U.S. I'm going to try to create this video. For some reason, it's not um, okay. It's, it's going to be fine. So we we built on um, the Concord's code app tool, and uh, basically with this tool, with the data set, as you see on the left, can can generate a graph quickly. 
and then can drag and drop different variables into the graph really quickly and then you can start to generate some graphs and visualizations and in this case the student was, for, uh, was dragging um, this is about energy use they're dragging information about how uh, the source of uh, electricity produced by the US uh, based on different sources and, and, and they're kind of able to produce um, a pretty sophisticated visualization based on the data provided by them. So with that, we put that in uh, the CODAP tool, it's called CODAP, put the CODAP tool in, in the sixth grader classroom and then we design again a pedagogical design or pedagogical intervention that involves a uh, student talking about um, this topic of UN sustainability goals and then they were engaged in opportunistic collaboration. So there were no specific area given by them, but they kind of naturally emerged to talk about a few different themes, such as poverty, such as gender gaps, such as um, um, climate change, and so on. Um, and then they were um, analyzing data about issues they were trying to solve, and they ended this unit by um, conducting the social media campaigns. Um, so that's kind of the, the general design of this, of this um, project. We asked some simple questions. The first question was, to what extent were students able to analyze open data? And also, how did students' data analysis facilitate their problem finding and theory building? And we collected two major sources of data. First one is 20, 21st student code app notebooks. Uh, by notebooks, I mean the interface you saw in the video is a, a notebook that contained data and some visualizations as well, and some text they wrote. And the second is a, was a written discourse in knowledge form. And we coded the graphs using some frameworks with, uh, from the literature, uh, such as the structural complexity of their visualization and the graph comprehension they were doing, uh, where they're trying to write some text to explain what they, what they see, what they saw um, in, the, in the graphs. And finally, uh, we also analyzed their content um, written in their discussion in knowledge form, focusing on their question and theory dynamics, um, because the process of doing data analysis is really a cycle. You start from the question, you come up with some theories, and you discover new questions you want to solve with the data. So we're trying to focus on this dynamics that took place in the knowledge form discussion. So that's an overview of the techniques. Um, so this is a, a visualization of the different levels of graph comprehension. And the first level is reading the data, the second is reading between the data, and the third level is reading beyond the data. Uh, it's, it was kind of surprising and also promising that the students, they were, pretty, they were able to do a higher level um, graph comprehension. But reading the data, that means you just read, for example, um, in this graph, um, the first column has 11. That's reading the data. Uh, and then we talk about reading beyond the data is actually um, based on the information that's provided by the graph, they're able to connect with other sources, other pieces of information and knowledge they have to make inferences, to make uh, evaluation, and then extend from the graph to talk about other things. So it was interesting for the sixth graders who were doing many, many sophisticated reasoning based on the graphs they produced. And those are some concrete examples from, from the, code, uh, the notebooks. This, um, those are both from um, the gender gap group. And we're talking about uh, women's uh, rights in different countries, They're, in this case, the student was trying to map the, the female life expectancy and the male uh, wage and salary workers on the y-axis. And the student wrote, uh, when I chose male wage and salary workers and female life expectancy was like 90% um, sure it would not work because there were about two totally different things, but as you can see, it worked. And it was like, what? So I have to say, I'm confused, so I'm so confused. So uh, it's uh, interesting, like students were playing with the tool, uh, manipulating visualization, and then really you get surprised and confused, and that's really important for, for learners. Getting confused is not a, a, a worse thing, but it's actually a good thing to motivate them to go further. And for this graph, it's structurally complex, but the reading the interpretation is le level one, because it's, it does, it's reading the data instead of thinking more about um, other things. And this graph is, is structurally simple, uh, but the text the student wrote was more sophisticated. For example, um, they're trying to map um, male life expectancy as male wage salary uh, workers percentage. So um, I'll read really quickly. Um, 
But my thought is I noticed that the man didn't live very long, typically have a long percentage been working. I also noticed that places in uh, South Africa and around the area that men mostly live very short but work a ton. Maybe this is because even though the men are working, first of all, they might not get paid a lot and so on. So these students were really trying to extend uh, from what they are saying in this graph to really connect with the uh, uh, complexity in that area. Um, so that's a very powerful message that came up um, by the student. So to go beyond this, I think it's even more interesting to see um, how students were incorporating those computational artifacts they produced by themselves into their discussion. So what do you see? This is a, a view uh, from their discussion. I mean, they were able to kind of use some of the graphs they produced um, and put them in their discussion forum and then add um, notes to explain them um, so that they can become more nuanced and, and grounded. Um, their idea become more supported by their analysis. So I will really try to focus on this, this group. This group was about climate change and, and talk a little bit about what they did. So um, this started by um, some, uh, there are a lot of interesting notes written by this group. Um, it started by saying, uh, I think we should focus on climate change because if we do nothing, nothing will matter because the world will, will be gone. Climate change is super boring to learn. Uh, some people don't learn about it and some people don't get, know the consequences. So we kind of know that adults don't care. Uh, <laughs> so they want to care. And some other student chimed in and said, I agree with you, climate change is one of the biggest problems because it's affecting animal habitats. And some people are doing absolutely nothing about it. If we do not do anything about climate change, no other problem will matter. War won't, discrimination won't, sexism won't, poverty won't. Nothing will matter if we're all dead. Um, so it's kind of a motivating discussion in the beginning. Um, and they keep going on, uh, such as this one. Uh, it's super important, um, it affects the planet, and so on. But uh, everybody should help out and stop climate change. So they have a lot of discussion that explaining their opinions, right? Opinion about climate change they could get from other places like the parents, or uh, what they saw on the news. And at a point, uh, there, there was a, a note that saying, I need data. Because after a while, they kind of maybe get bored um, by when they're talking, they say, I need data. I need data on countries pollute, more or less, and how they pollute. I need the data to find out how to be able to stop climate change. So they're saying that data is a way for them to see, to seek a solution, and, and to really go further than the, the emotions and, and their perspective they were trying to explain. So they did some analysis using a, a, data, a data set that Yen came up with, I think. Um, so this is one example of what they produced. They used CODAP and they, they used the data to generate this visualization, which is about population and the, the carbon dioxide emission uh, in different areas of this world. And this is a note um, the student wrote. Um, the student wrote that, to me, this graph shows that more people in the country, um, the more people in the country, the more CO2 they let into the air. Uh, but North America, the DAP, the dark blue dots is the same as the place the graph um, with the least amount of people but has a high level of CO2. So uh, the student was talking about this North America being um, having less population but pretty high in CO2 emission. So they're trying to kind of, they're finding out this um, on their own. This is another graph they produced, very different visualization even though it's the same data set. Uh, on the X axis, there are different regions, uh, different areas of the world on the Y axis is CO2 emission again. So what the student wrote is a much longer, longer note. I will read this quickly so that, uh, because I think it's pretty powerful. Um, the student wrote that, uh, my perspective is, I made this graph below because I think, honestly, if every, someone saw this, um, their perspective about climate change would have altered, or at least that's what happened to me. I thought for sure that Asia was a big problem to climate change then when I look at some real data and put the graph, everything changed for me. I even had to go back and double check my work. What the graph showed was that the main cause of climate change is in North America. It's so important to me because every old powerful person keep on saying to our country, oh, don't worry. Um, but really everybody was lying because every country did their part in making climate change such a huge problem. What makes me the most upset is that the country that I live in is the worst contributor to climate change and we're not doing anything about it. Since no one who has power running our country is doing nothing, doing anything about this issue, 
I think if kids give real complex information and spread awareness about the serious issue through the whole world, eventually some people who are smart enough to understand this will keep us kids and hopefully we can make it less complex for people like Donald Trump who <laughs> can't understand something as complicated as this. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a take, it's a, it's a children's take, you know. Based on their work, they double check their work, which won't happen sometimes uh, for adults. Uh, but they're making a strong argument, emotional charge, so driven, so powerful, and they want to spread the world, spread the, spread the word to the world. Uh, and that's what they did. Um, they planned a, a social media campaign by talking about how to do that, and they strategized about how to share the perspective, and they were building some websites as well. I think those websites are not published um, yet, uh, but this is the website they were building to try to um, make a case for uh, gender equality. And they were saying, my name isn't Princess. And the second one uh, was a website, um, it's about um, the climate change. And they were doing actually protesting outside of their school. Uh, this is from their public new Twitter, uh, Twitter feed. Um, that kids are actually mobilizing and, and really doing protesting in their, uh, in their school. So they, they really get motivated and and, and that is not based on any kind of information given to them. I think what's important is, as educators, I find it inspirational, is if I provide such support to them, support such as technology, pedagogical design, or, uh, or being open to their perspectives, not trying to teach anything about climate change, but giving them the opportunity to develop their understanding they were able to engage in very sophisticated academic practices that are so key in, in the society, in the society that we are facing epistemic crisis, in the society we used to usually choose what we believe based on identity or uh, based on uh, our affiliation, but not based on scientific facts or findings. So I find this very inspirational to, to see the kids work. Um, so I want to really make an open invitation uh, to you, um, so that we want to really um, engage engage young people to uh, build knowledge for the open, for the public and common good. And we're, we as a team in Minnesota, we're trying to um, put together a team that involves, uh, for example, expert in reading comprehension, expert in neuroscience, and expert in uh, data science, data mining, to, to build a, a sophisticated environment to engage students to to reason about the, the information in the, in the disinformation world. And this is another uh, project that kind of grew out of the data expedition project. We're developing an environment that we want to make this open, make it uh, become an uh, opportunity for students to participate in uh, open data per, uh, computation and then form community to express their, their ideas grounded on data. And also, um, I want to make the invitation for you as educator, as researcher, to champion student voice. Because student voice matter a lot, and we can learn a lot from them, which I think, I hope I demonstrated that to you today. And I also want to go back to what, uh, what John Dewey said is, let's end the great waste. The great waste in education is the disconnection between school and the society. So I'm calling for us to uh, end that, no matter what you're working on, no matter which part of the world you're working in. And with that, I want to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open to any suggestions and questions and ideas. Thank you.
some people will just reject the evidence saying that it's not coming from the right sources or the customer motives of those who provided um, the evidence. So when they're exposed to public discourse, students are exposed to all this side like aspect of the public discourse and have you tried to kind of uh, protect them in a way or provide guidance how to react or interpret those or like those are my Thanks for the wonderful question. That's a great question. Um, first of all, I think kids are better at than adults. <laughs> That's what we kind of find is they're more open to different ideas. They're naturally curious. So the part of the, the lab school in Toronto, and they wrote a book about natural curiosity, is kids are willing to engage with so many different ideas and being open to different um, possibility, even though you saw some uh, some written notes more emotionally charged um, and I want to also mention that the teacher played an uh, instrumental role uh, uh, for the Minnesota school the teacher was doing an um, artful work facilitated discussions so when the students find something that's contradictory or that's emotionally charged or divisive the, the, the teacher is playing a role that uh, engages them to think deeply and then, you know, to incorporate opposing ideas. And so the teacher has been a, a big part of that, is to support students to do that, which connect to your second part of the question is how that's exactly, I think, the project was trying to achieve, is to help students to see the complex informational landscape, right? There are different machineries uh, and the social structures viewed uh, that will shape what information they get and what responses they will have to different information. So that's the goal of this project is to engage them to think about information sources in the same time in being exposed to the side effects and think about it. I think that's a, if that happens, that's a success. I think um, that's part of the goal of this project. Lian, do you have anything to add about uh, from the Toronto site for the, for the teachers? I'll add on for the students because I was working with the grade sixes. So the climate change one was pretty surprising because they found out that North America has the greatest emissions. And the other examples I can think of were for sexism and like men versus women. And so um, like one example was that like they thought that if there were more women in the parliamentary um, system that the women would be paid equal or less or equal or more like than the males, like that there'd be a pay parity. But that was not the case. And so there were, like, when they were playing with the data, there were a lot of surprising findings. And as well, when, um, in another group, when they were um, studying governments, they actually found that there's a lot of issues with democracy. And then one of the kids was studying um, monarchies, and his theory was that if, if the family was actually genuinely good, you, people, citizens would do better in a mar mar monarchy government compared to democracy, which is what most people, like Canada's democracy as well, and this was also during the time of the elections, and we have our own mini Trump in Ontario right now, but um, it was just really interesting how the kids were, um, they were so open-minded, and, and then they would just go deeper with the ideas and kind of bring out these theories that even adults wouldn't think of, and so um, I think giving them the tools and supporting their idea development, their epistemic agency, and, and having them engage in the design mode is really critical for them to ha have all these um, beautiful perspectives that even adults can't think of. Yeah, um, can you talk a bit more about what do you mean by metaphor? You mean the metaphor the students yeah, I, came up with? People, people have their perceptions of the world, and uh, we all have. And we create mental models. 
models from those perceptions. And of course, we engage our imagination, and all of that would be of all collectively now shared at the human level, very individual. In that sense, it's a metaphor, a mental model, as it were, you have uh, insights into that from some of the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. Does that answer some of the questions for me about devices as to how to get to the issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting take on, on the work. I think that's, um, we haven't thought about that. Uh, but so far, the, we're focused on the technology design and all the discourse level, what they wrote. Um, but I think it's very important to get to the cognitive level or cognitive aspect of their learning and the, their mental models. But we haven't got that deep yet. And that's a wonderful direction we want to. Because the mental models often determine, <coughs> excuse me, the mental models determine how we act, whether, we, whether it's hidden or explicit. That's a more technical question. In the data stuff, where you have uh, learning on the line, uh, below the line, between the lines, that's a classic uh, literacy technique uh, with kids. Uh, did you give them that agenda, or did you deduce that from your analysis? This one? No, you, you, had, you were talking about on the line, below the line. lines. You had three levels. You had three levels. You talked about reading on the line, between the lines, uh, uh, and beyond the line. That's a classic primary school technique, to be honest, which is terrific. I'm asking you, did that come out of your data and your analyses of that data, or did you give them and your participants that agenda to start off with? This, is, um, this came from the data. The, the data. Came from the data. Yeah, yeah, we didn't ask them to target those levels. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, I can tell you build tech, a lot of technology as well based on the question. So um, for that example, the way we implemented it is to make a copy of the annotation and drag into knowledge form. And what, li what I liked about open source technology, uh, especially hypothesis, is to try to, they're doing open data as well. So every annotation has its own unique identifier that we can go back. We, the students, I didn't show that, is they can actually click on whatever annotation they incorporated in their discussion and then go back to the original context uh, where the annotation was made. So that kind of maintained the context of that original idea while in the same time they were able to incorporate this type of information. You make systematic use of that, so you have the copy, that's for the historical account, and then you can go to the, to the reference and, and see how it evolved. Did you make systematic use of that or? Um, so what do you mean by that? You mean the annotation could change? If you can, in, in the web annotation system, the discussion will go on. Mm -hmm. yeah? But at some point, you take a snapshot and you incorporate, say, a knowledge form. Mm -hmm. yeah? It makes sense to use a copy there. Yeah. And, and, but still, in the source, in the web annotation source, it, it may progress. Mm -hmm. yeah? And you could make systematic use of, of that. If this is what I understood. Right. So the, the annotation, Annotation students may usually do not, do not change. The annotation. No, but the web annotation, there can be more web annotations over time. Right. So 
they, they didn't they didn't go back to that to okay. check the so changes. They, so you just still write right. off. Yeah. Okay. You'll be maybe for the future design it could be more synced, right? Because you know, incorporate you incorporate a whole thread of conversation to make them more connected. Right now it's more uh, uh, incorporating the specific object mm -hmm. from the web page and then incorporate to the discussion. Yeah. We can talk more about the design to make it better. I have a more practical question. How do you select the, the data sources for the data expedition uh, uh, project that are useful for a sixth graders to uh, understand? Because if I go to our statistics department, sometimes quite difficult for me, so <laughs> let alone for sixth graders to understand what's really there. So how is that going? How do you do this? Mm -hmm. I'll talk more, maybe you will add. Um, so for any data source we select there, uh, so first of all, there's a data science education com community that's growing, I think. They're making an argument that we should not talk, talk, talk too much algebra. Instead, we should talk, teach more data science. Um, so engaging students to play with data is, is a way to help them develop mathematical skills. That's their argument. So, but the trouble of using real world data, it, it, is a, it is a challenge because it's usually messy, it's not well documented. So for us, we have a team try to identify data sources based on student interest and then try to clean the data for them. Uh, especially right now, they don't, don't have that much data literacy uh, to do that, so we're doing that by, for them based on their interest. And that's the same case for the current project we're doing now in St. Paul, is we help them identify data sources and organize them to a clean format. And the, the roadmap is to, at some point, when they're comfortable with CODA and DataX, they can discover some data on their own based on guidance we, we provide to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You want to add? I mean, like this, this might not be the best sounding answer, but um, I didn't really look clearly at all, like it was like 40 columns or more in the data because it was just real life data and the kids would just drag and drop mm -hmm. into the tool to find patterns. And so um, it, the, the point was the mathematical reasoning and the process behind it. But for example, and, and so for example, there's a lot of like, because these are the UN Sustainable Goals, there's a lot of data out there, like open data that they can use. So it was really just about them using the data and then if they didn't understand something like GDP, we would Google it and we would understand what that meant. But then they would they would play around with the variables and you can see in some of those examples, they're pretty intentional about what they're dragging in to see whether there are patterns. And some of them you know, had hypotheses before dragging them in. So it's a very authentic way to work with the data and they had some pretty intuitive senses of um, correlations and I feel like if we gave them like SVSS as the next step they would be able to do stuff so uh, they, they, they were pretty sophisticated as well in how they interpreted it for for example if there was a correlation like the low end versus the high end and then they would look at like an empty space and explain well there's no pattern there that's why on the far bottom quadrant there's nothing so they weren't necessarily using like advanced statistical terms but they they got an intuitive sense of how it worked and manipulating various variables and then, but then for example, in another case, when they were, because they were really interested in Venezuela and how the government was kind of being overthrown at that time. So we didn't have like real live data coming up. I think the closest thing was just certain countries were for or against the different leaders. And then they would try to like map that on. Um, but for something like climate change and for like um, gender disparity, you know, there's a lot of data out there. Truly, I think the best person to talk with. Right. And I, I know colleagues um, working in Eastern China, they're doing English learning as well. I can try to find a contact right. and connect you with them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so, to add one more question, you know, the 
because she's my colleague, I'm very interested in management as well. So I was wondering uh, what kind of context you are using this kind of technologies. So uh, do you apply this kind of technology in certain types of uh, courses, for example, uh, political courses or science courses? All subject areas. All subject yeah. areas. Yeah, we have a, a collection of literature showing different different subject areas, but for me, it's mostly science, but there are many other, uh, but also social sciences in the second project as well. So it's really across the curriculum. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks, Professor Chen and Professor Xiao. Now we would like to present our certificate of appreciation and gift to Professor Fu Dong Chen. Thank you.